Welcome to Transparency with Zeb King. Today on our show, we are lucky to have uh, the um, well. We are lucky to have Elaine Gallagher on our show today. Welcome, Elaine. Thank you. Um, and this show is about transparency, so I must have full disclosure in saying that I do know Elaine. Uh, Elaine was my excellent campaign manager for 2014 uh, municipal election, and and is a resident of the Peninsula area. So yeah, mm -hmm. um, Elaine. As well, some people might know you from UVic, correct? Correct. Uh, you're a professor, is that right? Yep. I was yeah. there for 30 years, Okay. Uh, taught nursing most of those years, uh, also did some consulting work with the provincial government and uh, finished up as the director of the Centre on Aging there my last three years. Oh, okay. So, mm -hmm. And uh, do you still work through UVic? Or? No, no, I'm retired now, okay. but right. I, I do private contract work once in a while in right. my field. Yeah. Great, yeah. And, and most recently, you've written a book. I have. This is uh, your first book, correct? My first novel. First, first novel, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Could to clarify that uh, yeah. as a professor, you've probably written books uh, on different chapters topics. and lots of sure. scientific articles. But no, this is my first attempt at a piece of fiction, and uh, I found it quite challenging. It was really, I was really out of my element mm -hmm. to begin with. Well, this is what I would like to explore a little bit: your book and and the experience of writing one. Um, and, and we have copies here. Sister Ships is the title, correct? Correct. And, and there's a, a, a fictional tale about, the, about Titanic's forgotten sister, the Olympic. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Uh, I've already, and I, I should uh, admit that I, I'm not uh, an avid fiction reader, and yet um, this one has been gripping me and mm. uh, getting me to want to read on and on and on. I uh, haven't finished the book, but okay. uh, and most people who host uh, have already finished the book. Right. But uh, but I'm I'm sort of on the same level as I think the viewers in that I'm making my way through it. Uh, and so please don't give away everything while we go through the interview. <laughs> <laughs> Um, no spoilers. No spoilers? Okay, good. Okay. Do you read a lot of fiction yourself? Um, I tend to be a binge reader. Um, uh, most of my days are very full with other activities, and I like watching movies, I like watching Netflix and different series and what have you. So I don't, I don't normally read a lot, but when I go on vacation, I take about 10 or 12 books, hmm. and I just read nonstop. And... Uh, or if I'm going away for a weekend yeah. or something, I'll take you know two or three books and I just just read them right through. So uh, I'm not I, I'm not a prolific reader, but I enjoy reading. I would have thought you were a prolific reader because when I read this, um, I'm thinking through. Okay, so what was Elaine thinking? How did she write this? Yeah. Uh, and and it's it's fascinating to think about that. Um, and then I thought, well, she must be uh, so experienced with writing uh, uh, this no. type of book. <laughs> I mean, characters and... and no, not at all. I mean, I have to say in all honesty, it took me about 20 years to write this book. Um, wow. I first had the idea for it years and years ago. And I started collecting stories. I mean, from the time I was a child, my grandmother used to tell me stories, which are included in the book some of them, hmm. and uh, I always thought that it would be a nice honor to her somehow to uh, put those into some form, some writing. Um, then as I got uh, older, I put it away for a long time until I had a chance to go to England and visit uh, her birthplace. Hmm. And suddenly I got very interested in what, what some of the stories she told me and lots of the pieces of the story that I didn't have. And that's when I decided to, to try, start thinking about uh, writing it as a fiction. Hmm. So yeah. the other question I have while I'm reading this book is, um, do you like history? I do. Because yeah. there's, there's parts of the story in, in there uh, that it's, it's teaching you a little bit. Uh, it's yeah. teaching you a little bit about history. And, and in particular, what I was noting was some... Um, class consciousness mm -hmm. that is uh, mm -hmm. that comes through in the writing, like yeah. sort of explaining to the reader about um, the differences in in between some of the uh, maybe upper class and and I don't know if the lower class or the sort of the, um, the working class working and class. The elite. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, I think with Downton Abbey and mm -hmm. some of the 
uh, series that you're seeing on television now and so forth, there's a kind of a renewed interest in that old era, um, in late 1800s, early 1900s in, in, in Britain. And um, it certainly held my interest. I, I love reading Emily Bronte and, you know, some of the writers of that, of that uh, period. And, um, and so issues of, of class consciousness are important. And I, I'm not a preacher, and so mm -hmm. I didn't want to write it in a way that um, casts judgment right. on the way people behave, but rather to try and get some insight and understanding. And so I did. Right. I read... A lot of things, as I was doing this book, I had took all kinds of little side trips. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I read about English man table manners. Right. You know, There's and a so part I remember. trying to incorporate yeah. some of that. I, I read about uh, the plight of uh, um, women in, in employment, uh, women in service in some of the, particularly the Nouveau Riche families, um, where the women quite frequently were abused, both physically and yeah. and sexually, and so forth, and that that is the case in my grandmother's story, um, and and just tried to get inside a little bit what what the day to day life might have been like for some of these people, yeah. So well, that that fascinated me. I, I I've been enjoying it from that perspective as well. Mm -hmm. So there's the story, but then there's some deviations from the story where you you learn a little, little bit about the the era. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and yet it's, it's done in a, in a way that it's not too much all, uh, it's just a little, uh, and then yeah. you, you learn a little bit. Well, that's yeah. the difference between you yes. know, writing a, a book about history and writing a pure novel. Um, so hmm. absolutely. And there's actually biographical material in it as well, although it's not a biography. Uh, it's interesting because I gave a copy of it to my aunt who did the paintings on the cover, mm -hmm. uh, the original paintings that appear on the cover of the book. She did those for me quite some time ago, but I, I took a copy of the book to her and she was so pleased to see the paintings. But she read the book and her comment was, well, well, you know, some of this isn't true. Mm. <laughs> and uh, so I had to assure her that, that that's often the case in novels, you know, right. that there were many pieces of the story that I, I don't have access to. And so um, you have to fill in the blanks, and that's what makes it a creative novel. And, so uh, was that um, contentious or no? That was just... um, well, I'm, I think for her, but mm. she's probably the only person alive mm. that actually knows some of this. I interviewed her on a couple of different occasions, quite at length, mm. before I sat down to write the book. Um, but there were some pieces that I, I didn't have, and I didn't know that she knew. But I think she's 96 now, and I think what mm. the book did was actually trigger some memories for her. Because when I interviewed her, she, she couldn't tell me a lot about her mother's life. She said, my mother never really talked very much about her life before, and I really don't know what happened. We don't even know that she missed the Titanic. So we built all this up uh, <laughs> to a point where, without giving away too much, can you give us a little bit of a summary of what the book's about, other than, yeah. of course, what we've already talked History. about? Absolutely. Um, basically, uh, it's the story of a young woman in England who's a governess working for a, a wealthy uh, family near Birmingham. Um, after a period of about 10 years, uh, she decides, or they decide, it's not absolutely clear who decided, but her employment terminates. And she books a ticket to come to Canada on the Titanic. She goes to a talk where they're advertising Canada and they have a slide projector and they're showing pictures of what Canada looks like. And um, so she's, she uh, is all excited about coming and something happens in her immigration papers don't come through in time and they, they rebook her on the sister ship. It's kind of like people that are going to get on airplanes now and you know the plane's full and you have to get rebooked and very upset. Mm -hmm. She wanted to be on the maiden voyage of the Titanic. But between the time uh, that she got this information and the time that she actually sailed of course then the Titanic sunk and you know the impact of that thinking that she should have been on that ship and, and missed it was quite profound. Um, I can't remember if there was how much time was there between the two uh, about when she three weeks. It. Three weeks. Yeah. So they did they actually continue 
sailing. Yes, that quickly, they took like, this. They took yeah. the the ships were identical. They were yeah. built side by side, um, and the Olympic sailed first. And it actually had about five sailings mm -hmm. uh, before the Titanic because it was finished first. And they made a few modifications on the Titanic, but otherwise they're they're absolutely identical. Um, and the uh, ship basically. Um, they took it out of service when the Titanic sunk for about three weeks mm. and made some additional modifications. They put on more lifeboats and um, did a, a sealed some of the ballasts and whatnot that, and tried to uh, correct what they thought were some of the perhaps design flaws that might have contributed to the mm -hmm. Titanic sinking. So luck had it that she missed the Titanic. Yeah. <laughs> And then three weeks later, she's sailing on the Olympic. Correct. And um, and and I, I recall from reading that she's ill. Yes. So so a good portion of the book mm -hmm. is about her trip, mm -hmm. her five day uh, sailing over to New York, and uh, for the first three days, she's basically confined to her bed. She had uh, quite a lot of nausea and seasickness and didn't feel well and. Um, because of that, she develops a very close friendship with the stewardess on her uh, deck. And the two. Of, this is another take on the, the name Sister Ships, because mm -hmm. it really, the story really concentrates at that point on the kinds of relationships that women often develop quite quickly that start off on a very superficial level, but very quickly peel away some of the layers of who they are as women and as people and as mothers and as daughters and um, people on trips often form very, very long-term lasting relationships and it's been my experience and so I drew on that to hmm. kind of uh, show the development of their relationship and they begin to unveil um, not only just their history and background but some of the trauma that both of them hmm. have experienced in, in various ways and that gradually builds towards a kind of climax towards the end of the book. I'm I'm currently around the part of the diary, uh, okay. reading, etc. <laughs> so anyway, um, which was is interesting. It, yeah. it has its own suspense as well. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so, can you? Uh, you know, I'm wondering in terms of writing a book like this. Do you see? Did you see it when you were starting it as a book, or do you see it in your mind as a movie? Oh. Right from the very beginning, I mean, I, I saw it as a screenplay. Really? Yeah. I mean, I how else do you do a sequel to the Titanic, right? Um, mm. But everyone I talked to said, well, you've got to get the book written and get it published and get it in print. And who knows, maybe someone out there, you know, will see it and realize that uh, that there there's another story to be told that, that could follow up on some of the events of the Titanic sinking. And there's a lot in the book about the Titanic because on the trip, my grandmother meets up with a group of other people who also miss the Titanic. And they come together and share some of their stories and some of the reasons why they missed it and what happened to them and the guilt that they were feeling. One man for, and some of these I drew from actual history. One man, for example, a preacher had, um, noticed one of his parishioners crying and asked him what the problem was. And the man said, well, I, my mother's quite ill over in uh, America and I can't get there to see her. And so he gave away his ticket on the Titanic and that no man kidding. didn't survive. Wow. And so, of course, he had great guilt. And so all these people were talking about their experience and what, what happened and why they missed the Titanic and then kind of what the aftermath of that was. And they came together mm -hmm. after. Uh, so, so, so there's a whole series of themes in the book and threads of uh, you know, content that kind of weave together. I don't know if that answers your question. Well, uh, part of these questions is to sort of get a sense of what what you um, were doing in order to write it, and and yeah. you said that it took it 20 years. To 20 get years of collecting stories, collecting books about the Titanic. I went to the Maritime Museum in Greenwich and got original brochures advertising the sailing of the Olympic and the Titanic, copies of them, I didn't get the originals. Uh, I've collected postcards from the Olympic, I've got three original mm -hmm. postcards that uh, were, were uh, based on, that were pictures of the Olympic on the front. Um, and, um, you know, visited my grandmother's village. 
people, the villagers there have been wonderful. They've given me stories of real events that happened there, uh, some of which appear in the book. And um, so, yeah, just took took a long time. So w I know that we call it, well, do you, you call it fiction, but based on um, some truth, reality. Based on true history, true history and based on some of my grandmother's yeah. life, yeah. With a, a weaving of almost three genres. <laughs> right. Historical right. biofiction. I don't know what else to call it. But, well, yeah. and it's entertaining as a read as well and oh. educational. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so for, for others who probably have stories to tell of their own family, etc., mm -hmm. or people who would like to write a book, mm -hmm. um, what kind of advice can you give them for um, that sort of pursuit? Yeah, I mean... the. For me, um, it was important to actually pick a day when I decided that I would start writing and to sit down. And I didn't start with writing the first chapter. I started with writing the, the story that I remembered the clearest or the one that was closest to my heart. There's a, there's a little story in there. It's called The One About the Blue Dress. And it is a story, a true story, that my grandmother told me about a childhood experience that she had. And um, so what I've done in the book is, ha is have her tell that story to a group of the children on the Olympic during the sailing. They gather in the, in the gymnasium to play and, she, and they ask her if she'd tell them a story. So she tells them a story about the blue dress. So, so that's the story that I wrote first because uh, it, it was clear in my mind, it was, it was meaningful to me, I felt a passion about it. And, uh, and, it, and it was my grandmother's true story. So I began there. And then I didn't, I didn't write it in sequence at all. But I knew eventually it, it, would, it would be in sequence. Mm -hmm. And when I did get all the pieces together, I had two or three people. I had my husband, a uh, friend Wendy Montgomery, and my daughter uh, take the book and read it. And they actually came up with um, some suggestions for how it could be sequenced a little differently. Oh. And it got reorganized uh, two or three times. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Is yeah. That, that's a is that a painful process? Um, that... <laughs> well, it, so you know you have to. I, I kept thinking, what what would this be like for a reader, jumping around, you know, from uh, one point of history to another? Right. And so I had to be really conscious that there had to be a flow to it. And then I hired a professional editor, mm -hmm. and she also did some reorganizing and put it into a context. The other thing that she did that was extremely helpful, and anyone that's going to write a book, I strongly recommend that, that they consider doing this. She took a lot of the story that I told and turned it around and let the characters tell it. Because at first uh, I thought it was my yeah. story and I was writing this story. And so I, I was writing it you know, as, though, as, though, as though I knew all this information and was telling all this, these facts and so forth. And um, she said, no, you've got some really rich characters here. I, I'm going to put this into their words. I mean, they're my words still, yeah. but, it, but it, instead of me telling it, they're, they're coming out of the characters' mouths. And that was a real, that was a breakthrough for me hmm. in terms of thinking about how to write and, and how to make something um, that, that isn't, you know, just the author Sure. Putting everything out, but making sure that the characters themselves were the people who were living it and, and experiencing it and talking about it. And it works in, to, in yeah. that way as well. So, yeah, that, yeah you get into the story um, yeah. and imagine the characters. And mm -hmm. That's yeah. very, very neat. <laughs> um, so that uh, is your book for sale anywhere locally? It is. Or, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, a number of bookstores have uh, taken it. They do it on consignment. Um, Tanner's have taken a few copies. Ivy's bookstore. Um, Bo uh, Bo Is it Bolin? Bolin Books. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Have it. It's, uh, it's in the bookstore at UVic, mm -hmm. the University of Victoria. It's also available online. Oh, is it? Chap uh, not chapters. I haven't even gone there yet. Yeah. <laughs> um, is it uh, uh, Amazon or Amazon. is it? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. it's available Kindle. there. Kindle has it. those sites, yeah. Kobo. Great. I wonder yeah. if our local library has it. We'll have Not to look yet. at that. No, I, and I, because I self-published, and that's oh. another thing that's a whole learning experience, um, I, I used a local company, um, Tellwell uh, Publishers here, and they did all the layout and the design and, and the cover and 
set it all up and then I used a local printer um, and uh, went with Island Blueprint and so both of these are local Victoria companies uh, that was important to me mm. be, because a number of people do get their books published south of the border and um, it's a lot more complicated I'd, ra I'd much rather do business here <laughs> um, but yeah it was uh, uh, an interesting process to have to learn then how to market your own book mm. and that is so far out of my comfort zone you know I, I just wish somebody else would take it over and go and flog it for me <laughs> but I'm personally having to go around to every single place and say here's my book would you uh, be interested in having this um, you know in your on your shelf um, same thing is true I've sent copies to the editor of the Times colonist and asked him if he'd be interested in doing a book review and if not if he because they mm -hmm. people have told me that he likes historical fiction mm -hmm. um, and or history anyway um, but I haven't heard back um, it's, you well, know, hopefully you will contacted uh, <laughs> CBC and yeah. you know different talk shows and said publish this book I don't know if you're interested and quite often you know I guess they get bombarded with an awful lot of requests and until you get a, a good book review somewhere or mm. your book wins a prize or you know um, it, buzzword gets out as a self-publisher I mean I think there's hundreds and thousands of us mm -hmm. out there who are who are doing this and I was told right from the start don't expect any miracles you know that this could be a very slow process and, it, and your book might never take off and that's okay but there's something about that where there's quite possibly there's hidden gems and stuff that are that haven't taken off that people can explore and, and look at as oh, well there are. rather than just the uh, the bestseller list etc but there's and local authors too yeah uh, that's exciting yeah. Yeah. no I don't feel uh, I don't feel bad at all I mean so um, you know the Harry Potter series uh, writer she she was turned down by something like 14 different publishers mm -hmm. uh, before she found somebody that would publish her book first time you know right um, so you never know yeah. yeah well do you think this is the first of a, of a number of books or, or 20 years all the work that's gone into this is enough for you <laughs> what well, do you think there, there is another story uh, uh, that, that goes on after it one of the one of the problems though with the next story is that t a number of the people are still alive that mm. I would want to write about mm. and and then, and then I don't know if I could do it as fiction. I'd have to, I'd have to really stretch it, hmm. because there, there are some more stories that need to be told, and I'm afraid to do it as, you know, in, uh, as a, a real life biography or autobiography or whatever. Yeah. Uh, in the sense that that um, I'm not sure all those people would appreciate having their story told. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly, if you if you were turning it into a bit of fiction, and uh, yeah. yeah, so yeah. it's a challenge, yeah. Um, yeah. But um, I was just wondering if you would mind reading a section from the the book. Would that okay. Be, yeah, mm -hmm. that'd be great. Thank you. Um, I'm going to read you a little section uh, about a true event in history that took place in the village where uh, my grandmother was from. The area is called Swaddlingcote, and it was a mining district in the Midlands, in the middle of England. Betsy is having lunch with a couple of girls who are traveling to America. And she says, would you like to hear a story about the worst strike in the history of English mining? Oh, please tell us, pleaded Elizabeth. We're all history buffs, and we love hearing about these things. Well, this happened nearly 18 years ago, Betsy began. The strike occurred right in my region of Swaddlingcote in 1893. I was only 11 at the time, but I remember it vividly, as we were all deeply affected by it. It began when the mine owners decided that coal mining the cost was too high, and they, and they announced plans to cut the wages of the miners by 25%. This caused an uproar, especially in our part of the town, since the workers there had already had their hours cut, and they were having trouble feeding their families. My father would come home looking so sad on most days. That's when he started spending more and more time at the pub, in fact. In late July, the men went out on strike, thinking it would be a short time until the mine owners gave in. 
Instead, non-union workers were recruited, and that's when the violence started to erupt. The owners had to bring in outside police reinforcements, and people were getting desperate for food. Those with gardens were best off, and they shared what they had, but it was only a short-term solution. We had no garden. I still remember the day when my father came home with a dead sheep in his arms. Where did that come from? asked Mama. It was loose on the road down by the schoolyard. I reckon anything found wandering in these parts must be considered fair game. Mama could hardly make him take it back if he didn't know to whom it belonged. Someone at the pub reported finding a note next to a meatless skeleton that read, You are rich and we are poor. When this is gone, we'll find some more. And wow. the story goes on to talk about a stranger who came along and began offering uh, bread and cheese, enough for every child in the, in the village to have food. Um, and no one knew who this stranger was, and it was quite a mystery. And that's a well-documented story that's true, the whole, the whole thing. Thank you for that reading. Have you read the book to your, I, I think you have grandchildren? I did. You did? Yeah. I got them to read to me the story about the blue dress, my favorite story. Yeah. And they loved it. And as a matter of fact, last Friday, they invited me to their school out really? in Souk. Oh. And I read to the grade four class and did a talk about my wow. book. And they wanted, they asked me to come as a, a writer yep. and talk about what it was like to write. And it's interesting because I asked them to keep track of anything new that they learned and to write it on a piece of paper. I gave them all a sheet of paper and, and then I collected them at the end and, um, and I summarized everything that they had learned and sent it back to their teacher. Hmm. And I said, this was amazing, the hmm. number of things that these kids actually learned. That I, They learned that, that there's a replica of the Titanic being built in right. Australia and all kinds of things that, that I just happened to mention in passing. And so I was able to put that together for them. So, so that was fun. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's fantastic. <laughs> so, in a, you know, this is a story. It's a great story, but it's also a gift to... To um, my children, to and my your grandchildren. children, your grandchildren. Yeah. It's it's wonderful. Thank and you. we're going to a family reunion in Saskatchewan and about fifty mm -hmm. family members are coming and they've all said they'd like a copy of the book. So wow. I'll uh, again for their children and their grandchildren because it's it's a story about our grandmother. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I certainly hope you can write another uh, historical fiction. Um, and uh, but yeah, certainly uh, I'll make my way through this one first, and I'm okay. enjoying it so far. Mm -hmm. um, CM, thank you very much for coming on our show. Okay. Great, thank you, Eileen. Well, thanks for having me. It's been fun. Good. Okay. Yeah.